led to a very distinct break in the narrative. Because up to this point, from chapter 2 to chapter 12, we've been dealing with Jesus' uh, public ministry to Israel. And we've talked about the seven signs that are identified in these chapters that, in, that uh, prove Jesus to be the Christ. And that's why sometimes the first 12 chapters of, of the Gospel of John is called the Book of Signs. But now in chapter 13, the upper room discourse begins. Jesus is, no, is now no longer walking amongst the hostile Jews. He and his disciples have gone to an upper room in Jerusalem for a final time of fellowship. Um, they don't know it's his final time of fellowship before he goes to his trial and his crucifixion. So as we look at chapter 13, uh, we know that he's alone with his 12 disciples in the upper room. Verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, already having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Okay, so we find Jesus now in the upper room. This is, this is on Thursday. This is the, night, the, the afternoon before his arrest. This is the day before the crucifixion. He knew that the time had been fulfilled. The time had come for him to die. For him to rise again from the dead and him to go back to heaven. Uh, but it was saying during supper. Now, some, some translations saying in verse 2, saying supper being ended, that really is not an accurate translation. It's really during the supper. Um, now, the Bible doesn't refer to what supper they're talking about. Was this the Passover meal? Or was this just an, an, an ordinary meal that Jesus was having his disciples? Don't know. Really, it doesn't matter. But what we do know is during supper, uh, Satan had already sowed the thought in Judas's mind that the time was right to betray Jesus. Now Judas had been plotting against Jesus for long before this, but now he was given the signal for carrying out his evil plans. But as verse 3 tells us, Jesus, knowing full, he was fully aware of his, of his deity. He knew that the work that had been committed to him, he knew that he had come from God the Father, he knew that he was going to return to him. But in spite of the fact that he knew who he was and he knew his mission and he knew his destiny, he got up from the supper. He took off his outer long, long outer garment, wrapped himself with a towel and began to wash the feet of all the disciples. He, he, he took the place of a slave because it was common courtesy for a host to have uh, a slave a servant to wash the feet of his guests when they came into the room but here Jesus himself God's son the Messiah our Savior he became the slave and performed this lowly service now Peter was absolutely shocked uh, and he expressed disapproval that Jesus should be condescend himself to, 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 uh, 
to wash someone as unworthy as he was. And so he said, he said, Lord, are you really going to wash my feet? But Peter, I mean, uh, Jesus was teaching to Peter that there was a spiritual meaning before, to what he was doing. Foot washing was a picture of spiritual washing. Peter knew that the Lord was performing the physical act, but he didn't realize the spiritual significance of what was taking place. In fact, none of the disciples recognized the spiritual significance at this point. However, every one of them would soon know it because uh, Jesus is going to explain it in just a few minutes. But Peter also would know it by experience when later in chapter 21, when Peter, I mean, when Jesus restores him after his denial. But I want you to notice the two extremes, and Peter illustrates both extremes of human nature. In verse 8, he vowed, never shall you wash my feet. And the word that's translated never means not for eternity. He meant, he didn't mean just not now. He meant no, not ever, no, uh, absolutely not. But what Jesus looked and said, he said that apart from it, from his washing, Peter could have absolutely no fellowship with him. So the meaning of foot washing is beginning to unfold. Was Jesus interested in clean feet? No. No, he really wasn't. The whole point was two, twofold. One was, as, just as physically as the disciples and all the people of that day, as they walked through the world, their feet got dirty because of the dust and the sand and the, and the open sandals. But as we walk through the world, we also get defiled. Um, listening to vile talk, looking at unholy things, uh, working with ungodly people, uh, just being in this, in this world and us still having our sinful nature that is inherent in each and every human being, uh, we, we, we become defiled. We need to be spiritually cleansed. And that cleansing takes place through the water of the Word. Jesus said to Peter, He said, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. That is, the fellowship, our fellowship with God, our fellowship with Jesus will always be hindered unless we are continuously being cleansed by the uh, by, 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 by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. But look at the other extreme in verse 9. When G, First Peter said, Nope, not now, not ever, no way, no how. You're not going to ever wash my feet. And then he said, No, don't wash only, don't, not only wash my feet, but wash every rest, all the rest of me. Now, in his reply, Jesus said, No, nah, that's not necessary. Now, I want you to notice he used two different words. Verse 10, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. He, he's, there's a difference between the bath and the basin. Uh, the bath speaks of the cleansing that we take place to salvation. How many times do we need to be saved? Once. When we, when we are saved, we are saved forever, are we not? Right. When we are saved, we are spiritually cleansed. Our soul is, is uh, the guilt and the stain and the filth of sin is taken away from us. We are, we are bathed once. But the basin speaks of the cleansing from the pollution of sin. How, how, many, days, how, many, how many times are we affected by sin? How often do we have to, to confess sin? How often do we need to repent of sin? How often do we need to admit, Lord, I sinned every single day. And so that is the spiritual significance of the washing of the feet. Uh, there is only one bath where there are many foot washings. Uh, but then he said, you were clean, but not all of you. And verse 11 explains that. He knew that Judas would betray him. Now at this point, did the disciples know that someone was going to, who was going to betray him? 
No. In fact, he didn't even explain this to the disciples at this point. He said in verse 10, He who has bathed, he's only to wash his feet, but it's completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. Now I want you to make a mental picture. He knows the one that's betraying him. Of course, we know now with 2020 hindsight, that was Judas. And yet Jesus still washed his feet. He washed all 12 of the disciples' feet. He knew that Jesus, Judas was going to betray him. So he singled out one, although he didn't identify him here, as have, never having had that bath of redemption to start with. The story continues in verse 12. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is written, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. For now on, I am telling you before it came to pass, so that when it does occur, you may truly believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So, Christ has finished washing the feet of all of the disciples. He puts his outer garments back on. He sits back down. And now he begins to explain the spiritual meaning of, of what he did. And he opened the conversation by asking a question. Isn't that just like Jesus? The questions that he asked. Do you know what I've done to you? Now the disciples had acknowledged Jesus many times as teacher, as their, as their teacher and their Lord, and they were absolutely right in doing so. But if the teacher and the Lord had washed the disciples' feet, what excuse would they have for not washing somebody else's feet? Now, did the Lord, did he really mean literally that they should be washing everybody's feet? No. Was he instituting an ordinance for the church of having a foot washing? Absolutely not. The meaning here was spiritual. And he's saying two things. One, he's saying is that they should keep each other clean by the constant fellowship over the Word. We have to constantly read the Bible, study the Bible, meditate the Bible, about the Bible, talk about the Bible with each other. And when we see someone erring, when we see someone going astray, do we go whack a finger in their face? No, we take the Scripture and say... Let's sit down and see what the Bible says about this. That's the spiritual cleansing. But then the other significance of what, what Jesus is demonstrating to them is an act of service. He wants to serve everybody. I, I did this one day in church in a worship service. We were talking about this particular passage and we were talking about service. And uh, I said, our deacons are going to come forward and they're going each going to bring a bowl of water they're going to stop at each aisle and they're going to wash the the, uh, the feet of the person that's sitting right by the aisle and then they're going to give them the basin and the washcloth and they're going to wash the feet of the person next to them and it's going to go all down the line and then there was some squirming and they were seating and i said no i know what some of y'all are thinking some of y'all thinking i ain't going to touch that man's feet i ain't going to touch that i'm not going to do that after church, I got corrected by one of, a couple that was one of our best friends. She said, that is not at all what I was thinking. What I was thinking was, how am I going to get these pantyhose off so he can wash my face? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the significance of what he's doing is that we should serve one another. If pride 
or personal animosities if or anything else prevents us from serving our brethren we need to remember that we're not any we're, we're not greater than god himself we're not greater than jesus and yet he humbled himself to wash the feet of those who were unworthy and of, of all the disciples that jesus washed their feet that night how many of them were compared to jesus were unworthy how many of them were unthankful how many of them were undeserving Every single one of them. But yet Jesus didn't, didn't think anything about it at all. He, sat, he, he stooped down, knelt down in front of them, and began to wash their feet, even washing the feet of the one that betrayed him. Would you wash the feet of somebody that you knew was going to betray you? Or maybe already had. His whole lesson is, and he says this in verse 15, I, if, uh, verse 14, if I washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. Now, we should never think of ourselves as too, too lofty, too high and mighty, too uppity or too dignified to be, I'm not going to stoop and do something like that. We got to do exactly what Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? Did he come to be served or did he come to serve? He took the role of what's considered to be the least important slave's responsibility. Now we know that, don't we? don't we? Don't we know that we should serve one another? That we should do anything and everything that we can to help one another? Don't we know that? Yes. yes. Okay, we're getting two that said yes, and we're getting through three or four nodding ahead, and we still got one that's laying out saying, no, this is a trick question. <laughs> no, it's not. But look at verse 17. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. There's a promise in there. What's the promise? You'll be blessed. You are blessed. There's a condition to that promise. In fact, there's actually two conditions. If you know them, and if you do them. Is it enough to know that we should serve one another? No. Well, I know I should be serving Barbara. I mean... She, 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 she's got a need and I can meet it. I know I should. But if you don't. But if I don't, what good does it do to me to know it? Lord bless me, I know she needs help. No. It's, not, it's one thing to know, it's another thing to do. The real value and the real, uh, the real value of the blessedness that comes from doing them. Now, everything he just taught, everything he just explained, did not apply to Judas. Because look at what it says in verse 18. I do not speak to all, of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Lord, I mean, Jesus knew from Old Testament that he knew. He's quoting here from, John, from Psalm 41 that his betrayal must be fulfilled. Now, for three years, Judas was the one who had eaten his meals, and yet he lifted up his heel against him, an expression indicating that he was the one that was going to be betraying the Lord. Now, why did Jesus say that? He said, he said it first of all up in verse 10. You are clean, but not all of you. Verse 18, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones that I have chosen, but as the scripture may be fulfilled, he who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Why is Jesus saying these things? Why is Jesus telling them that he's going to be betrayed? 
19. Verse 19 is the answer. He said, I'm telling you before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will know that I am. Now, most of our trans English translations say, I am he. That he's not there in the, in, the, in the actual Greek. So it should read, if you read the actual Greek, it says, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am. What is, what is Jesus saying when he says that you may know that I am? He's, a, he's God. He's asserting his deity here. It's, he wanted them to know that when this came to pass, the betrayal came to pass, which Jesus knew was going to be just in a few hours, that they, the disciples, would recognize deity so that you may believe that I am. Jesus is the Jesus of the New Testament is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. And this is one of the greatest proofs. Fulfilled prophecy is one of the greatest proofs of the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, because, the, uh, because Jesus knew that the prediction of his betrayal might cause the other disciples to stumble or to start doubting, he added a word of encouragement. They, they were going to be sent on a divine mission. They were going to go out. They were, their whole purpose of Jesus discipling them for these first three years was so that they could go out and spread the message of the gospel as, as the church began to move and began to grow. And so he says, an, an encouraging word in verse 20, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives... You receives me, and he who receives me receives the Father who sent me. So they were to be so, he, what he was doing was encouraging the disciples to be so closely identified with Jesus that to receive them was the same as receiving him. And those that received the Son received the Father as well. Are we sent? Are we his disciples? Are we sent on mission? Yes. Are we not the lighthouse? Well, the same thing is to take place with us. He who receives us, who, they, those who receive our message are receiving Jesus. And when they receive Jesus, they're receiving the Father. Well, let's talk about his betrayal. Verse 21, when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking.
speaking, there was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who, who it is among you. Tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. And he, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus then answered and said, This is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. And so when he dipped the mor morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And after the morsel, Satan and then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now, none of those that reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For they were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, Buy the things we have need, for, need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Now, verse 21 says, the knowledge that one of his disciples would betray him caused Jesus to, to be deeply stirred. It, 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 it's almost as if Jesus was giving, in this case, Judas, although he hadn't been identified yet, and he was giving him a final opportunity to abandon his plan. And without exposing him directly, Jesus was re revealing his knowledge that he knew that one of the twelve were going to betray them. But apparently this didn't change Judas's mind at all. Now, the disciples didn't suspect Judas. They had no clue who it was. They were absolutely surprised and stunned that one of their number would, be, would even do such a thing. And they were completely puzzled as to who, who it could be. Now, he talked about the... the, the the disciple leaning on his bosom, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Of course, that's John. That's how John referred to himself. He never mentioned himself by name in the script in, in his gospel, but that's how he referred to him. And Peter probably used some kind of. So he said he gestured to him. Maybe it was a nod of a head or something like, "Go ahead, go ahead, ask him who it is." And so the verse tells us that he leaned over and he looked up. Maybe it was in a whisper. Lord, who is it? And maybe Jesus answered back softly too. He said, the one I give the morsel to. The one I dip in, give the morsel and dip. Now I want you to look at verse 26 because it, 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 it tells us something very important. That is the one to whom I dip the morsel and give it to him. What's he doing? He's telling who he's... Well, he's telling me now, but physically, what's he doing? You got to think outside the box, and you got to remember this is we get out from behind them. He's proven to us that he's southern. He's taking a biscuit and sopping it. I mean, everybody at southern knows about sopping a biscuit and some gravy, you know, or whatever it may be. But he said, it's the one I take. The morsel, the one I make, take the sop and give it to. Uh, he's telling them that that's the sign he's going to do. And so he took it and he dipped the morsel. He gave it to Judas. Now he just told John that, and, and the other disciples may have heard that, may not have. I don't know. It doesn't say. But Judas took the morsel. I mean, Jesus took the morsel. He dipped it. He sopped it. And then he gave it to Judas. And verse 27 says, at that point in time is when Satan entered into him. He had already put into Satan's heart to betray God. Now at this verse 27, he, it says, and Satan entered into him. First, it was, it was just a suggestion. But Judas entertained it. He liked it. He agreed to it. And now Satan is taking complete control of him. And what did Jesus say to Judas at that point? First of all, did Jesus know that, Ju that Satan had entered into him? Yes. Yeah, he knew it. Because he is, he is God. So he knew that. And what did Jesus say to him? Do it quick. What you do, do quickly. 
Now, everybody heard that. But verse 28 says, they don't know what they were talking about. He said, they still didn't know that Judas was going to betray Jesus. Some of them thought that he was, because Judas was a treasurer, that he was to go quickly and buy something for the feast. Or maybe they thought that Judas, Jesus was telling Judas to go make a donation to the poor. But all we do know is, is that Jesus, Judas received the, 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 that sopping biscuit and he went out immediately. He left, he left Jesus. He left the disciples. But don't let this last phrase slide by. And it was night. Not only was it night in a literal sense, but it was also night in a spiritual sense for Judas. It is always night when anybody turns their back on Jesus Christ spiritually. Verse 31. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. So as soon as Judas left the room, Jesus began to speak a little bit more freely and more intimately. Apparently the tension was gone. And he said, Now the Son of Man is glorified. He, would, he was anticipating the work of redemption that he was about to accomplish. Now, his death was going to seem like defeat, wasn't it? Yet it was the means by where all lost sinners can be saved. It was followed by his resurrection and then his ascension into heaven. And he was greatly honored in him. And it said, and God is glorified in him. You know, the work of Jesus brought great glory to God the Father. It proclaimed him to be a holy God who could not pass over sin. He still had to punish sin, but he also was a loving God who did not want the death of, the, of a sinner. On the one hand, he has to punish sin. He said, I can't stand sin. I hate it. If you sin, you, the penalty for sin is death. But on the other hand, he's a loving God. He never intended for any of his children, any of his creation, any of us as human beings, to be in hell. He created that for Satan and all the, uh, his demons. So he's a just God. He has to punish sin. He's a loving God who wants to, doesn't want to punish the sinner. So what did he do? He solved it all through the person of Jesus Christ. He sent his son, his perfect son, to come to the earth, to die on the cross, to satisfy the, the, the payment that was required for sin, and at the same time, for those who believe in him, for those who accept his substitutionary death, it, re, it spared those, all of us who believe. So, he was glorified. The Son of Man was glorified. And God is glorified in him. Now, verse 32 starts, if God is glorified in him. If is the wrong word. Because the, real, the, the word that's translated as if really ought to be translated as since. 
There's no question God is glorified in him. So since God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself. God will see that appropriate honor is given to his beloved son and glorify him immediately. He will do that without any delay. Now, did God glorify the Son? He said, Now, the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. Since God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself, and will glorify Him immediately. Did, did God the Father glorify Jesus the Son? I'll give you a hint. No is not a correct answer. Did God the Father glorify Jesus, God the Son? Yes. 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 Now the question is, when and how? When did he do it? Immediately. Well, he did do it immediately. But how did he do it? It's not hard. And you're not going to find the answer directly in these verses, but you're going to find the answers in the knowledge that you already know about what happened. Resurrection. The resurrection. He glorified. He, he, if you go back to, back to Philippians, he talks about how, God, how Jesus was obedient, even to the point of death. Took on the form of a man. Nailed him, was nailed to the cross and he died. But Jesus was resurrected on the third day just as he, the Scripture said would take place. So God highly exalted him by not only resurrecting him from the dead, but 40 days later, ascending, him ascending into heaven. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. In fact, that's that him out of Philippians says, for this reason he is greatly, highly exalted. That's where the glory took place. He glorified his son immediately by raising him from the dead, seating him at his own right hand in heaven. And then verse 33, for the first time in the, in God, in the Gospel of John, he has referred to his disciples as little children. That is a term of endearment. Mm -hmm. And he says he's trying to prepare them for what's fixing to take place. He's telling them in no uncertain terms, I'm going to die. He said, I'm, I'm with you for a little while longer. At this point, we're talking about just a few hours. He said, you will seek me. But just like I told the Jews, where I'm going, you can't come. Well, Peter jumped down in verse 36 and said, well, why can't I follow you? Where are you going? And Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't follow me now but you will follow me later. Now, is that the same thing he told the Jews? No, he didn't tell them they were following him. Absolutely not. He told the Jews, where I'm, where I'm going, you cannot come. Ever. He's going back to heaven. He's telling them that they're not going to be going to heaven. Why? Because they have totally and completely rejected him. Now, Peter and the other disciples and all of us, he said, where he's going, we cannot go now. But we will go later. Did Jesus keep his word? Yeah. It's exactly what he's doing. But he said, in the meantime, even though I'm fixing to leave, you can't go now. You got something else to do. And he said, I give you a new commandment. Verse 34. I give to you, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, you also love one another. Now, what's new about that commandment? I mean, didn't the Ten Commandments teach us to love? Didn't all the Old Testament teach us to love God, love others, love self? Didn't Jesus, when he was approached by the 
But by, by a man said, what's the greatest commandment? Didn't he say you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might? And the second one is just as good. You shall love your, uh, your neighbor as you love yourself. What's new about this commandment? Even as I have loved you. Yeah. He what? Even as I have loved you. It was new because Jesus had been a living demonstration of it. It was new because the Holy Spirit would empower believers to obey it. It was new in its superiority because what did Jesus say? The, the, the law said, love your neighbors, right? What did, God, what did Jesus say? You have heard it said that you shall love those who love you. But I say unto you, you shall love your neighbor and your enemy. It was new because it, it called for a higher degree of love. As Jim just said, you are to love as I have loved you. Now let me ask you a question. Do you love others? Yes. I know you do. I don't, I don't, I don't, come on now. Do you love others? Yes. Do you have love in your heart for those who don't love you? Sometimes. <laughs> but do you love others the way Jesus loves you? That's what he's telling us to do. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, you also love one another. Why has he given us this commandment? All right, let me put it this way. Wanda, how do I know you're a Christian? How do I know you're a disciple? You can tell me. Does that mean anything to me? She does it by her actions. What actions? Her good self, helping people and doing everything, and sharing her love. Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Say it a little bit louder. My love for others. That's exactly right. He said, a new commandment I give to you, you love one another, even as I have loved you. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Barbara, what exactly what you're saying. Right, you show your love. You right. show it. You show it. It, there's an unbelieving world out there and they're never going to believe the, believe the gospel of Jesus Christ until they see, until they see Christians living what they, what they believe. Love one another. Now there's several more passages we're going to be reading in a couple of, couple of weeks that also prove that we, are this, that we are a disciple of Jesus Christ. But this is one of the ways in which we witness to the world. All men will know. That, and when it says all men, does that mean all disciples? All believers? It also means all non-believers. Everybody. And it's not talking about the, the gender men. It's talking about humans. All people. will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now again... As we mentioned it a while ago, Peter said, well, Lord, where are you going? And why can't I follow? Why, why can't I go with you right now? He said, Lord, I would lay down my life for you. Peter's not thinking. Peter doesn't have a concept of thinking he's about to go back to heaven. Even though Jesus has told the disciples three or four different times he's going to die. And after three days, the temple is going to be restored. They still haven't grasped it yet, and I'm not going to give the disciples a hard time over that because, quite honestly, if I'd been one of the 12 disciples, I'd have a hard time conceptualizing that too. But Peter's assuming he's going somewhere else, maybe to a, to a distant land, maybe on another journey. Why can't I go with you? I will lay down my life for you. That's a bold statement, isn't it? Anybody know what Peter looks like, by the way? When we get to heaven, we're going to be able to recognize Peter. Truth of the matter is, I think he's going to be the easiest one to identify. Because he's going to be the one walking around heaven with a foot-shaped mouth. 
because he was always sticking his foot in his mouth. He said, I will lay down my life for you. Do you think Peter believed that? At the time he said it. I yeah, I think he believed it too. I think he believed it too. I mean, he thought on his own strength he could endure anything, including death. He said, I'll lay down my life for you. He said all these others may scatter because he said this in, in one of the other gospel accounts. All these others may scatter, but not me. You can count on me. I'm true blue. And what did Jesus say? Is that so? You know, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. You know, Peter had a lot of zeal without a whole lot of knowledge. But he told him, before the night is over. It's already night. We know that from verse 30. He's now he's saying, a rooster will not crow. So he said, tonight, you're going to deny me three times before the sun comes up. Three times. His martyrdom, he was said he would, he would I'll lay down my life for it. Wasn't even going to last his own strength. Wasn't even going to last one night. But he said, you will deny me three times. And we know because of his weakness, because of his cowardice, and because of his inability to follow the Lord for even a few hours, Jesus knew exactly what was going to take place. So thus, we come to the end of chapter 13. However, even though there's a gap of a few inches on your page and a week in our study between chapter 13 and chapter 14, it's the same conversation. It's the same, con the same uh, lesson at this point. So that's what we'll pick up with next week. Let me give you an opportunity to ask questions or my voice any concerns or anything at all. Well, I want to close it this way. The words of Jesus. Love one another, even as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know you are truly my disciple. If you have love for one another. Let's close. Father God, we want to just say thank you. Thank you for the fact that we, have, we are loved by you, by Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. And you loved us enough for your son to die on the cross. We read in this, in this chapter tonight and we see how his soul is greatly stirred because he knows that the hour has come. But yet, in spite of it all, he remained obedient to you and enabled us to be able to be reconciled unto you. Now you've called us to be on the same mission that the original disciples were on. To go and tell. To show love and to spread the good news of what Jesus did, because what Jesus did for us, He has done for every man, every woman, every child who has ever been born. So we thank You for the fact that we have been cleansed, we have been washed, and we are clean. May we look out for one another and point them to You so that they too can receive that washing. We love you. We praise you. We glorify you. For this is our prayer in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.